Hello and welcome to RF Design Tutorials. This is Tutorial 16 on Practical Power Amplifier Design. This is a three-part tutorial and the current video is part one of the three. Remaining two videos will be posted pretty soon on my YouTube channel. Now, the uh, objective of this three-part tutorial series is to take you through from a simple device to a finalized power amplifier layout, which has been validated for one-tone, two-tone, as well as modulated signal analysis, including performing the digital pre-distortion or DPD to obtain uh, the right specs, which your PA needs. Uh, to be you know, used in any kind of wireless communication, whether it is base station, um, you know, handheld terminal, uh, base PA design, etc. Now, before we start, subscribe to my channel. Once you subscribe, don't forget to click on the bell icon to enable all the notifications. And after you watch the video, kindly give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends and colleagues who may be interested in watching similar tutorial. Now, as I talked about, it will be a three-part tutorial series. So here is a quick snapshot of what you can expect in each of the tutorial. In part one, which is this tutorial, we will get started with PA design. We will cover these six topics in sequence by which you will, by the end of this tutorial, you will have a good source and load impedance for this Cree device. And then in the second part of video, we will start with performing uh, the matching network design in ideal matching network, as well as then converting it to a micro step uh, based representation. And then we will optimize the PA for fundamental and harmonic performance. And we will perform the compression and two tone analysis of the PA. After successful completion of all these validation, we will then proceed to create a layout for the PA and then perform EM circuit co-simulation to do a final validation. Now, third part of the video, we'll talk about performing modulated signal analysis because in today's wireless world, it is not sufficient to just do one tone or two tone based PA validation because the, the waveforms which we are using today has a very high PAPR. And with, with a higher peak to average ratio compression, it's always good to do a modulated signal analysis to really look and, and see how the PA will perform in a modulated condition. And we will finish off the third part or this video series of PA design by doing a digital pre-distortion simulations inside ADS to see how can we improve the PA linearity to obtain a much better performance uh, so that we can get efficiency as well as a good linear performance out of our PA design. So hopefully a lot of exciting topics and uh, like me, you are also excited uh, to go through this journey. All right, so if you are ready to take the deep dive session, uh, nothing is you know pending, let's go straight into it. Now, uh, why do we need power amplifier? Well, power amplifiers are in your transmitting chain of any wireless system, whether it is a base station, mobile phone, and any handheld device. They are final amplification stage before your signal is transmitted. Therefore, they must produce enough output power to overcome the channel losses between transmitter and receiver to make sure the link works um, with the best possible quality. Now, PA is a typically a primary consumer of power in any transmitter. So major design requirement on a PA is how efficiently your PA can convert DC power to the output RF power. Now this efficiency uh, translates either into a lower operation cost. If you think about a cellular base station where 50% of your electricity bill might be only due to the PA operation or in terms of longer battery life for a handheld device such as our mobile phone. We all will love to have longer battery life so that we can you know, work on our phones much, much longer or watch videos and do various things. Right, PA linearity is another important requirement and in there the input and output relationship must be as linear as possible so that we can preserve the signal integrity of our signal. Now these two often are very conflicting requirement because ideally you can either have a good linearity 
or a good efficiency. And a design of PA often involves a trade-off of efficiency and linearity. Now, if you recall my LNA design tutorial video, there the, the trade-off was between noise figure and the impedance in the input uh, written loss. Similarly, in PA, you have efficiency and linearity, which are conflicting requirement. But we will see how, how do we tackle all these challenges and still do a pretty good um, power amplifier design. Now, in terms of class of operation, I'm, I'm assuming all of you already know about the basic theory of um, power amplifiers, but still for the sake of completion and making sure we are all in sync, I have a couple of slides here. So the typically uh, class A operation is, is like what you call as midpoint operation where you bias your transistor device at the midpoint or what we call as IDSS by two and have a full 360 degree conduction. And here the theoretical efficiency can be obtained is as 50%. However, realistically you have around 50%, uh, 20 to 25%, so my apologies. So in class B, you have a lesser heating problem than class A because in class A you are operating full 360 degree. In class B, we bias our device at the cutoff point so that you only have 180 degree conduction. So theoretically efficiency can reach 78%, but you will have some crossover and distortion problem uh, due to this hard clipping of the PA. The more practical class is class AB, which is in between class A and B. That means your device will conduct anywhere between 180 degree to 360 degree, depending on the bias point which you select, as shown in this um, picture here. So in this class of operation, your conversion efficiency uh, can reach uh, somewhere close to 50 to 60 or even 65% depending upon how good uh, devices and how good uh, design you can you can perform. And similarly, you have class C, uh, class D, E, F uh, kind of um, you know, applications, and each one of them have their own pros and cons. Uh, class D, E, F are often called a switched mode amplifier because we intentionally drive the device into saturation like a square wave. So devices operates like a switch instead of operating as a classical transistor. Now this on off nonlinear switching makes the conduction angle almost to zero. And theoretically you can have 100% efficiency. In practical, uh, there are many design papers and the references which show around 70 to 75% of efficiency, which can be obtained from class F or inverted class F kind of amplifiers. Now, uh, if you want to learn more about these class of operation and how those that efficiency is obtained and how can you you know set up those analysis and simulations in ADS on a device level or on a theoretical level, my colleague Matt Ozalas has you know posted plenty of um, you know videos around that topic, and I'm providing this link in the description uh, below this video. Feel free to go and explore. There are a bunch of videos there which is very going to be very very helpful, and. And in, apart from these uh, videos, you also have a lot of um, you know, non-linear stability analysis, which is another great feature in new ADS version, uh, whereby if you are doing RFIC or MMIC kind of uh, multi um, you know, parallelized kind of amplifier design, they are going to be very helpful, allowing you to do a loop gain based state non-linear stability analysis. So feel free to explore on your own. Now, any design uh, of a good PA always starts with having a good nonlinear model, and it is vendor's responsibility to give you a good nonlinear model. Now, you can obtain these models from depending on which manufacturer you are using. And in this video, if you want to follow all the steps I have shown here, I have obtained this design kit from by registering on Cree's website. And again, I will provide this link in the description box so that you can go and register yourself and uh, get the permission from Cree to download their design kit and use it inside ADS for your work. Now, this design kit, um, uh, apart from having this design kit, vendors can also give you data in you know, various other formats. And in case vendor is not helping you, you can have your own nonlinear model development using tools like Keysight IC Cap software, which is again, very, very popular tool to do your own device modeling. 
error, you can use a measurement based model such as X parameter, which can be extracted out of nonlinear vector network analyzer offered by Keysight. But again, depending upon which vendor you work with, what's your application, you can figure out a way. But again, the bottom line is you need to have a good nonlinear model to have a good PA design, which is very predictable so that what you simulate is what you are going to see during the measurement. Now about GAN devices, because uh, the device I'm going to use from Cree is a GAN device. And GAN devices are very popular these days to do PA design, um, mainly because they have much higher power density compared to other technologies. So ha having higher power density will allow you to generate more power in a similar amount of area as compared to gallium arsenide. Also, those devices have a higher impedance, which will make your impedance matching job much easier. And they are higher voltage devices, which reduce the need to do voltage conversion, leading to higher efficiency operations, um, you know, as a company or as a, as a project. Now for this tutorial, I have taken this case study and I'm going to use um, a pretty old Kiri device, but it's very popular and very well mature device, uh, CGH40010. And now Cree even has a second generation or a newer device for the same you know, kind of um, uh, specification, extending the frequency up to eight gigahertz. This particular device is uh, for operation up to uh, six gigahertz. Now we will target our design uh, for it around 2.4 gigahertz with plus minus 100 megahertz, uh, 10 watt output power, which is uh, 40 dBm. And these are the gain and efficiency. Uh, and efficiency, I would like to have more than 50% because I'm going to do a class AB kind of configuration for this um, amplifier tutorial. IP3, I'm expecting around uh, 45 dBm or higher. Right, pretty suitable. Now, don't get discouraged if you're doing five gigahertz, 10 gigahertz kind of design. All the techniques I'm going to teach you in this three-part tutorial series are equally applicable irrespective of your frequency. So even if you're doing a high frequency uh, power amplifier design, they still are very, very valid. Now, before we jump into you know doing PA design, it's always a good idea to go through the data sheet, which manufacturer provides you. And while going through the data sheet, you know, keep uh, looking out for some of these specification because uh, some of these will give you the baseline when you do things like load pull, for example. So referring to data sheet, you will know tentatively where uh, to set your source and load impedances uh, to reduce the iterative effort, which you sometime need to do in load pull to get to the right point. Also, these data sheets will give you some demonstration uh, circuit schematic and layout. It will give you some initial idea of possible circuit topology, which you can expect or which you can work on. However, it can completely change based on how you design. But again, it's still a very, very good reference. So let's do that. Let's go through this data sheet and look at some of the key um, you know, specifications or key kind of figure of merit. Now here's the device which I'm using. It's a 10 watt device and that's what I'm designing the amplifier for. A DC to six gigahertz, it's a gallium nitride as I talked about. Now, if you look at a small signal gain uh, around the frequency which we are working is around 16 dB which is pretty good, and a 13 watt typical saturated power. So usually for GAN devices, it's like a 3 dB. Um, you know, uh, saturated power, what they mention. 65% efficiency at PSAT. And usually the vendors will always mention train efficiency, not the power added efficiency. So as a designer, you need to distinguish it very, very carefully. Now, usual power amplifier specs are written for power added efficiency, which will be slightly lower than the drain efficiency. And it's recommended for 20 volt operation, 28 volt operation, which is perfect what we are trying to do. And also in terms of application, if you look at, it is applicable for broadband, cellular, class A, A, B, and linear amplifiers suitable for OFDM. And that's perfectly what we want because we want to do class A, B amplifier design for 5G application, which is typically an OFDM system. All right, so that's the first thing. And then you get to your DC uh, operating points and DC conditions. And here's your typical range for uh, the gate 
um, you know, bias uh, and I'm going to use minus 2.7 anyways, but we'll figure out uh, how did I arrive at minus 2.7 volt, not only by looking at the data sheet, but actually doing the IV characteristics. Now let's just scroll down and there are various plots of compression gain and, and all that, but let me reach to this point. So at this you know, page here, you can see uh, vendor is recommending or providing information about the, the best possible source and load impedances versus frequency for getting the best possible power. But again, uh, remember these um, impedance specification are always mentioned with respect to um, you know, the, the bias condition. And if you change the bias condition, they may not be valid, but again, it's a good reference or good reference point. So Z source um, around our frequency, you know, an aggregate magnitude is around five ohm. And if you look at about load is around 20 ohm or so. So that's a pretty good baseline. And this information will be very useful when we reach uh, a load, a load pull uh, point. So keep, take a note of this uh, here. All right, similarly, if we go, uh, keep going further down, you can see a demo board, uh, which vendor can also give you. And you see how the PA is mounted. And this is how typically, how all high power uh, PAs will be assembled. So you will have a metal flange and you will mount this device uh, directly on that flange. And now there are two kind of packages which is available. One could be a screw down type package, another could be like a solder kind of package, but that's pretty popular way of doing the PA assembly because you don't want this high power to be consumed on top of PCB, uh, like how can we mount the device for low power or the medium power or LNA uh, kind of application. And also, um, you know, how do you do this PCB design is very subjective. I have seen, um, you know, many designers, they keep the input part of the PCB and output part of the PCB completely separate. And they have this flange going all the way down. Or sometimes you can have the single PCB with a cutout for this device mounting. So again, it's user choice and nothing is good or bad. It depends how you would like to, you know, implement it. Now, if we go to the next page here, we can see a picture of a demo amplifier circuit schematic and it gives you some basic idea about the kind of decoupling uh, they have used uh, the input matching and the stability network and as well as the output matching network uh, for the pa now a lot of time you don't need to blindly follow these many capacitors um, and all that because usually vendors will always do a broadband, you know, kind of board design, and they will overcompensate, um, you know, by putting a lot of extra things to make sure the device shows as good performance as, as possible. But in your real application, you, you really may not need these many bypass capacitors and so on. But again, that decision is left to designer depending upon how noisy they expect their power supplies to be. And accordingly, they can take a call. But the good point to, to note here, uh, the lowest um, capacitance, which is, means the higher frequency, uh, will always be closest to your you know, transistor. The, the bigger value or the biggest value will always be closer to the DC so that it can compensate for a low frequency humming, which might be you know, coming via power supply. All right, so that gives us some idea, initial idea what to expect. You can see some series resistance here used to stabilize the device, although it's pretty big value, uh, which I would like to avoid personally. And then there are a couple of placeholders as zero ohm resistors, uh, which, which can be used in case it is necessary. And then you have some coupling capacitors here. All right, so that's good enough information. So always keep, um, you know, pay equal attention to the data sheet because as I said, you can get a lot of useful information coming out of this data sheet, which serves as a baseline uh, for your real circuit design. Now let's directly jump in to ADS here. So in ADS, we, um, we are going to talk about this part one, and I will take you to all the key steps which I mentioned in the in the original slide here so let me go back to that slide so that we can keep track all right so in part one uh, i already provided you about the introduction and class of the operation now let's uh, start with our second step where we are going to perform dciv characteristics and a bias point analysis for our device 
Now here with this uh, template, uh, I already covered all these uh, videos, how to perform DCIV simulation, how to perform a stability analysis in my previously posted videos. So I'm assuming that you have seen all those tutorial videos already. If you have not, please go ahead and see those videos first before you continue with this um, you know, uh, topic here. Because it's very difficult to explain all those basics when we are talking about how to do a power amplifier design, right? So here, the template I have used um, can be obtained from insert template. And here I have used a fit uh, curve tracer template, which I already talked about in the earlier video. So once you have the template, you click OK you will have a skeleton, something like this, available in your schematic. And now you can connect your device uh, from the library. So here you can see on the left-hand side, I have installed the key uh, Cree library. And how do we install library uh, or vendor library into ADS? Well, you can go to design kit, manage library, and browse to the location where you have kept the uh, lib.dev or where you have unarchived uh, the library which you obtained from vendor's website. All right, so here, all these basics are already covered, but I just gave you a refresher. So here you can see the CGH40010 uh, device. This is my gate bias from minus two to minus four, pretty much like how it was referred in data sheet. And here is the drain bias. Now notice in drain bias, I'm sweeping from zero to 70 volts. While this device is only 28 volts, so somebody might be wondering, why are we going to 70 volt? Well, a good tip always in power amplifier because you are going to plot the load line and, and, and those kind of stuff. It's always recommended to sweep the train voltage at least two times of your desired operating voltage. And I'm going to use 28 volts, so ideally I should have gone to 56 volt, but anything extra which you add, it's, it's more than welcome. All right, so let's go ahead and perform simulation. And now we will have a data display with this template. Now, as I talked about earlier, my colleague Matt Ozellis has uh, those uh, PA videos and I'm operating, you know, using one of the templates which is provided in his, um, you know, uh, first session, which is class A, A, B and B, uh, uh, you know, uh, tutorial. So once I obtain the workspace, I'm only using the one of the data display templates because it has a lot of equations already implemented, which makes my job easier. Now here, one marker is posted on IDSS point, as you would expect, and the, based on the second marker, you will have voltage and current waveforms, the power dissipation, and this table showing you the output power, small signal gain, large signal gain, efficiency, a DC current conduction angle duty cycle all these things are updated now notice uh, usually you will obtain this voltage and current waveforms by doing a harmonic balance simulation but here uh, using the equation uh, which my colleague has implemented we are able to estimate all those uh, from the load line based design equation so they are estimation they are not exactly what harmonic balance will sh show you but it's a very very good and accurate um, you know, uh, uh, post-processing. Now, based on where you keep your, you know, operating condition with marker two, you can see the waveform is changing, the conduction angle is changing, and rest of the parameters are changing. So if I operate my device on class B, um, you know, where you have conduction angle of 180 degree, you can see the efficiency goes up, and here is the power consumption, which is only happening due to this 180 degree uh, conduction of your of your current and it's clipping um, in half of the uh, cycle but again so depending upon where you place it for example if i place it in class a configuration you can see conduction angle is 360 degree and you have the full 360 degree current voltage and then power dissipation is all continuous all right so based on my understanding referring to data sheet i have uh, selected 28 volt uh, operation with minus 2.7 uh, as gate voltage, which will, um, you know, approximate it to give me large signal gain of 12 dB. And if you remember our spec, we wanted gain of more than 10 dB, which is pretty good. 
The efficiency is close to 46% as estimated by just simply the DC analysis. But once we do load pull and we find the right um, you know, optimum load operating point, this efficiency will easily cross over 50%, no problem. And also the output power predict is around 36 TBM. And again, with the right you know, power match impedance matching, we would be able to get easily more than 40 uh, dBm. So it's all in all, it's a pretty good operating uh, point where I am expecting to have 256 degree of conduction angle, which results in around 70% of duty cycle. So that finishes step number one of finding the right DC operating point uh, for your power device. Now we take that information and we proceed to next step. So what's our next step? Is to perform the stability analysis, right? So in a stability analysis, uh, here I'm using uh, an instrument kind of look and feel, and this kind of component can be obtained uh, from going to simulation instrument palette. And here I do have this SP uh, network analyzer or NWA component, which will give you look and feel of uh, network analyzer and you have uh, input and output to be connected. And the bias is inside and you can just set these parameters which you want. Now internally, you know, it's just a visual appeal, but internally is the is the same kind of bench which you uh, will end up creating yourself. You can see this input termination, DC block, DC feed, and you have V bias one, V bias two, and that's where your device will get connected uh, here, all right? So just for the you know sake of eye candy or introducing you to a new uh, kind of virtual instrument which you can get in ADS. So I connected this device. Um, you will set the same bias which we computed of minus 2.7 volt to 28 volt, and I'm going to analyze this device from 0.5 gigahertz to 6 gigahertz, which is the maximum frequency recommended. Now here I'm using some data display templates uh, because I don't want to even, you know, prepare my own graphs or write some equations to, to calculate the stability factor, etc. Now, how can you get access to this uh, kind of data display template? Well, if you go to any simulator, for example, this parameter or anything, you have this component here called display template. If you place this display template component onto schematic, you can double click and you can browse to installed templates. And under product, you will have a lot of these pre-configured templates uh, which you can use. And all of them are like data display templates where they will have certain number of plots or equations written already to do your job. So from the list available, I'm using S21 plot, a network analysis plot, and also the, the stability circle and the you know, gain stability circles, etc. So see what happens once I have this template and if I perform the simulation, I get all these kind of plots. And if you refer at the bottom uh, here, we get multiple tabs uh, depending on the templates I'm using. So here one page per template and we can look at the stability circles and you can clearly see your device is not stable at the, the 2.4 gigahertz where my marker is or where my frequency selector marker is. And if I change this marker, you will see those stability circle points change and it shows you uh, what kind of stability performance you have for that device. So obviously, uh, you know, till around four gigahertz, you can see I'm less than, uh, you know, factor of one with mu load or mu source. And if any one of them is greater than one, my device will become unconditionally stable. And also the rollet stability factor or what you call as K is less than one. So clearly our device is not stable at around 2.4 gigahertz. So let me place this marker uh, closer to 2.4 uh, gigahertz here. And you can see the <clears throat> stability circles are cutting the smith chart. Now, how to stabilize the device? Again, uh, taking cue from the uh, from the data sheet, um, I knew there is a series resistor which can be placed to stabilize this device. Now, like we discussed in LNA video, where I said don't place any resistive device at the input of the transistor because in case of LNA, it affects your noise figure performance. It distorts it. 
In case of power amplifier, uh, try avoiding placing any resistive component in the output stage or in the drain terminal because that will suck up all the gain which you have obtained uh, by some amount. And it's in power stages, it's very difficult to obtain gain. And anything which you have obtained, you would not like to sacrifice by putting a resistor. Plus, that resistor will need to be of much higher wattage because you are going to produce a higher power. So it's always a good choice to place a resistor at the input of any power amplification device. Now with this 5 ohm resistor, if we go ahead and perform simulation, now you can see uh, my stability factor is greater than 1 and it's actually greater than two. And now the load and, and source stability circles are outside the smith chart. That means at around 2.4 gigahertz, my device is unconditionally stable. And actually, um, if you look at here from one gigahertz onwards, your device is a broadband stable. So if you have to work in anywhere in this zone, now you can confidently go and design your matching network. It's already you know, kind of stabilized. All right, so that was step number two. So we worked on and stabilized our device at the operating region we are working at, and we only use five ohm resistor. Now, when we use five ohm resistor, it's not only a you know good idea to only keep looking at stability factor. You need to be also concerned with how much gain has dropped due to that resistor. And here, if you look at this parameter performance, and if I place a marker around 2.4 gigahertz, I can see I have an unmatched gain of around 11 dB, which is pretty good. And it's a small signal gain. And once I do impedance matching, etc., my gain will be even more. And my requirement is anyway to have more than 10 dB gain. So that's pretty good. So my resistor hasn't affected too much of my performance, but it has stabilized my device. Good enough. All right, so let's go ahead into the next stage of our uh, PA design process. And the next stage obviously is to perform a load pull, right? And I already posted three videos on load pull. Please um, make sure you watch the load pull videos before you continue here, because I'm not going to explain the fundamentals of load pull and how do you understand the data from load pull. Now the template which I'm using here is simply obtained as I demonstrated in tutorial videos by going to design guide, load pull, one tone load pull and constant available source power, because that's always you're getting started load pull. Now, once you bring out this template, I have connected the stabilized device, provided the right DC bias as we uh, finalized. The RF power is 2400 megahertz. Now output power, which I'm expecting is 40 dBm. And we just noted the gain is around 11 dB or so. So the input power I have decided to feed is 29 dBm. Now the Z load uh, fundamental is kept around 20 ohm. And where we got this information from? Well, remember this data sheet? There was a page where you had uh, the source and a load impedance divided here. So I just selected 20 ohm as um, you know one of the points. And also remember this uh, Z source fundamental, I kept it as five ohm. So again, in this data sheet, if you refer to, that's the kind of, uh, you know, impedance you are looking at. So even if, you know, the vendor is not giving you uh, the source impedance information for some reason, for any GAN device, selecting 5 to 10 ohms is always a good choice. And if you are using LDMOS, again, 5 ohm or so is kind of good choice there. All right. But more information you can get um, from the data sheet is always better. Now, the second and third harmonic of the load, I have you know, terminated into open circuit, or you can decide to terminate into a short circuit. Yeah? And so that we can look at the fundamental uh, performance there. Or you can even perform harmonic load pull. All those templates are already available uh, there. But when you are starting with your first um, you know, load pull, it's always a good idea to terminate it either in an open circuit or a short circuit. Now, once we go ahead and perform this load pull, we can see um, the contours. And here, um, you know, uh, we can see we have, we are able to 
achieve more than 40 dBm of power from our device and efficiency, which is much higher than 50%. So probably it was a good zone to perform load pull. So we already have all the data here. Again, as we discussed in load pull video, you have the condition which is giving you the maximum power as well as gain, which is around 12.5 dB and also the operating condition, which can give you the maximum PAE. And these are the load points where you can vary the marker and see uh, the operating condition, PAE, uh, output power, and so on. Now, here you have a decision to make because using the load pool, which we perform, we are able to get uh, the desired output power as well as efficiency. So you can either use this um, impedance specification of said load, and you can see it is also giving you the input impedance. So you really don't need to perform a source pull in order to get you the best gain or to find the right source impedance for your PA design. One template is giving you everything because often I get a query how to do source pull, etc. If you want to do source pull, the template is available, but frankly speaking, you really don't need to unless there is a you know something which is not you know um, given to you by this template so again if even if you look at the maximum pae operation which is around 65 percent you're still able to get very close to what you're looking at in terms of output power so you can either select this z load and z source combination or you can select this uh, Z source and Z load combination, and you can proceed for impedance matching network design from here. But the question is, uh, is it uh, recommended to go directly jump into impedance matching? Because you are able to operate the output power, but right now you don't know how much dB compression you are operating on. You don't know how much IMD uh, level you are going to get, etc. So again, depending upon what you are looking for, you can go back to ADS schematic and you can utilize the other templates, which I also talked about in the early video. So you can sweep the available source power. You can see how much compression level you are working at. You can display contours at a specific XDB compression point. And if ACPR or EVM is your concern, you can also plot contours of uh, ACPR or EVM at a specific output power or at a specific uh, XDB gain compression. Similarly, you can even do two-tone uh, load pull simulation because if IMD is your prime concern, you can also get IMD contours if you do two-tone load pull. But here I'm showing you a way how to how to avoid doing all those and directly utilize the latest available templates to still get your job done before you end up confusing yourself. But this fundamental load pull was very important because we need to make sure we have the right power as well as right efficiency. All right, so we got this information. We got our area where we need to work on. Now, what's the next step? to do your PA design or to progress with your PA design. Now remember in the last load pull tutorial video, I showed you how to use graphical methods of um, computing the recommended load points. And then we use those load points into an XDB compression template and I also provided a knowledge center link for you to download uh, the workspaces created by my colleague Andy Howard. So I'm using one of those templates which I demonstrated in the last video. Here I already used the graphical load pull uh, method because I, I knew from my first load pull simulation which zone to look at. Now I went to that zone and selected the area and I exported only those load points and as an MDF file. And now I'm going to perform a load pull only on those uh, you know, points as necessary, uh, which could be a much smaller zone. Now for this load pull, I have terminated my source impedance to the complex conjugate of what we calculated in the earlier uh, you know, analysis of load pull, because this will give you the maximum gain if you terminate your source term, you know, um, source termination into the complex conjugate of what you obtained from the load pull. Now, input power I'm selecting as 28 dBm, and 3 dB is my target operating range. Rest of the parameters is already set. Now. 
as we discussed, we can start optimization. And now this template will make sure all the contours, all the data shown to you in the load pool only belongs to around 3 dB compression characteristics. So it will filter out everything which is highly compressed or which is under compressed. It is only going to give me the details which are relevant for me to get to a 3 dB compression point. Now, if you're looking to do 1 dB compression point based design, feel free to change it to one and then you can still use the same template as it is. There is no change there. But typically in GAN amplifiers, we, we talk about 3 dB, you know, kind of gain compression value. So this will take few seconds for, uh, for the simulation to run. But again, as you can see, I have simply inserted uh, my uh, Cree device along with my stability resistor and nothing else has to be changed. So it's like just drop in your device um, you know, set up some key parameters and you hit the optimization button and let ADS do your job. So now the simulation is finished. Now I will have a data display showing me the, the right format of data or the value which I'm really interested in. So here in the center, you can see the contours belonging to 3 dB operating condition of this device. Here is the efficiency and here is the various power levels of various contours and also gain you can see is around 13 dB which is which is kind of pretty good uh, obtained. Now the final information is simply contained in the tables uh, which are shown here. The red one is showing you the maximum PAE operation and the blue one showing you power delivery. Again I already discussed all of this in the previous load pool tutorial. So take away from me here again for a 3 dB operation where I'm getting more than 40 dBm power and efficiency of around 57%. This is my Z load, which I need to design impedance matching for. And this is the Z in uh, for which I need to do the input and in, uh, input impedance matching network. And again, if you want to go behind highest efficiency, which is 66% and even you go behind it, you can see you are still able to operate, you know, get more than 40 dBm. So these are your impedance matching, um, you know, uh, targets. And again, both of them are pretty close. So there is nothing more. So which is a good sign that this device will give me the best possible efficiency with the best possible output power. And I would be able to meet my design requirements by a by a good amount and also the large signal gain is, is more than 12 dB against my target of 10 dB, which is again a good news for me. So all in all, pretty good. So I got my load impedance as well as source impedance uh, from this analysis. Now, what do we need to do next? What are you going to do next? Well, the next requirement, of course, is to do impedance matching. Now, before we go into impedance matching, which actually will lead us to the second part of this video or second tutorial, which I will post in next few days. Before we go there, just one final step, which I always like to do is to create this kind of schematic where I check my impedance matching requirement and I perform harmonic balance simulation as well as S parameter simulation, just to get a sense of how a perfectly matched power amplifier would look like for me. All right. So in this case, rest everything is still the same. I have the same um, RF frequency, so, you know, bias condition. Input power is set as per what we obtained just now from load pool. And notice these two variables here. ZS is set to the complex conjugate of what we just obtained. You always remember that whatever load pool gives you, you need to do a complex conjugate of this and use that number in your source termination. The load termination has to be used as it is. You don't need to take a complex conjugate of this. So once we have these variables set, but before we assign those numbers to these termination, I just want to see in a 50 ohm operation, how my PA will perform. And here I do have a bunch of um, equations computing my power delivered in watts, power delivered in dBm, the input power, the DC power, then I'm commuting the power added efficiency 
as well as I'm computing the train efficiency so that we can match that efficiency number from the data sheet if required. And then based on power delivered and power available using these equation, I will be able to do a large signal gain uh, you know, calculation. So instead of relying on graphs, etc., I have written this equation. And again, these equations are available as a part of template, or you could simply write it yourself. Now, I load, V load, all these are name of these nodes. You can see there is a current probe here, and all of these have been named properly. So if you try to replicate this kind of template or equation on your side, make sure you modify my equation based on the names which you are using at your side. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and see how this device operates in a 50 ohm. Now here's the output power spectrum. You can see the output you know, power on this graph is around 38 dBm. And same thing is predicted by my equation for now. And then you have a power added deficiency, which is around 40%. Now remember the first DC analysis we did, this is what DC analysis predicted, around 36% uh, or something like that efficiency, and that is what we are getting. The drain efficiency obviously is slightly higher. Large signal gain is around 9 dB, in power output in watts is around 6.3 dB, and these are your small signal gain and a small signal uh, input and output matching. And these two are current waveforms, uh, the VDSSI. Now, uh, remember we talked about intrinsic voltage and current information. Now, depending upon which device vendor uh, device you are using, when you simulate as a part of data set, uh, they will um, you know, also give you uh, some things like IDI, which is intrinsic train current, and also the voltage, which is VDSI, which is intrinsic gate voltage. So if you want to plot the dynamic load line, et cetera, you should be using these voltages rather than you know, uh, plotting the dynamic load line, et cetera, using this voltage and this current. Because VDSI and IDI shows you how's the voltage and current inside this device, right at the train terminal of your gallium nitride transistor. So they show you the true picture of how much your FET is conducting. Because anything which you get at outside at the load termination point is, you know, when your signal has already transitioned through package and when, you know, some of those parasitics are already included. But intrinsic uh, voltage and current gives you exactly what's happening at the terminal of a gate. So imagine you open the FET and put a probe right at the train terminal of your device. So this is very, very useful. You should look at it. Now, so that was 50 ohm operation, of course, we expect that. Now let's change this to ZL, which is what we obtained from load pool and complex conjugate of the source impedance. Now this is you know, creating a condition where your amplifier is perfectly matched for fundamental frequency, not for the harmonic frequency yet. It is only a fundamental frequency. So your harmonics will also see the same terminations, which is not optimum. Remember in load pull, you set it to either open circuit or short circuit. Here, your harmonics are also going to see the same source frequency, same load frequency. So let's see what happens. So we'll go ahead and analyze this. And now look at the table there. So output power, as predicted by load pull, is you know around 41 uh, or higher dBm. Efficiency is around 56%. Drain efficiency is 60%, which is very close to what was mentioned in the data sheet of, of the device here. If you go to the first page, so we are we are able to operate pretty close to what has been you know showed to us in data sheet, pretty good. The last signal gain is around 12.5 dB. This is what exactly our load pull was saying. And output power delivered is around 13 watt. And this is what your data sheet also talks about, 13 watt of typical PSAT, right? So all in all, everything is falling into place pretty nicely. Now, 
here is a difference. So don't confuse yourself when you look at this spectral plot. And if you put a marker there, it is reading 38.7 dBm power, whereas this is showing 41 dBm. So what's the difference between two? Now, when you use dBm function in these plots, it is always referring to 50 ohm as a reference impedance to do your power computation. However, if you remember the P delivered um, you know, equation, here it is, it is reading your instantaneous node voltage and the current, and that is based on the ZL specification. So that's normalized or calculated as per this impedance, not the 50 ohm. And you know this impedance is not 50 ohm because this is 28 plus J 0.5. All right, so there will be always well, you know, this kind of discrepancy unless you unnormalize this dBm calculation to the load impedance which you are using. So be mindful of that and don't end up confusing yourself. Right, so here is the the voltage and current, you know, uh, profile after you terminate the device into nice matching condition which you are looking for, and here is your gain, a small signal gain which is going to be around 15.6 dB. And if you go back to data sheet, uh, this is what roughly we are estimating around two gigahertz. So it's a perfectly matching condition. And the output match, not so great because we went for power match. Remember, we haven't gone for simultaneous conjugate match. We have gone to match the device to the best possible uh, you know, power uh, condition. And again, this is a small signal match. This is not a large signal match. But looking at this power, we can confidently say it's a good large signal match because we are able to extract the maximum power. And you know maximum power can only be delivered if you do a complex conjugate match. But that is large signal matching, not a small signal what you call as uh, you know s22 and there are templates available inside areas to do large signal s11 large signal s22 if you want to do that but for now i'm only doing things which are shown to you in data sheet and they always show you small signal matching conditions here all right so going back uh, to our you know agenda for this part of tutorial we covered we went through the pa introduction classes of operation dciv and bias point analysis we looked at stability analysis performed the initial load pull and then we went ahead and performed a 3 db based load pull to finalize our right source and load impedance and finally did a validation of source and load impedance which we found in step number five in a, in a PA operating mode and make sure if we do the right impedance matching, we will get all the design specification as we are looking at. And that would lead us to part two of this video where we will continue this learning and we will design the input and output matching network. And there are plenty of good tips and tricks which you need to know by for doing a right matching network design for PA amplifier, you know, PA kind of um, operation. And we are going to talk about that in part two video, and then we will finalize the PA by optimizing it and doing a layout in EMCO simulation. So that's all for this video. Hope you thoroughly enjoyed the content presented in this tutorial, and I look forward to see you in part two of this tutorial series. Have a great time designing and wish you all the best in your design work, my friends.